All right, everybody. It is so fabulous to be uh, back here and having another class. I missed uh, doing this. I missed all of you guys who, who have been in on the classes before and welcome to anybody who uh, is, is new for this evening. And huge thanks to the Vineyard Haven Public Library and to Anne, um, <laughs> who is always welcoming my crazy ideas about what we can do. And so tonight, um, logging with Hazel. Who hey. knew, right? <laughs> Speaking of crazy ideas. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So we've got Michael tonight, and he is going to be telling us about uh, how he fell into logging with Hazel. Uh, and um, uh, he's got some great information to share with us, pictures and that kind of thing. And then, um, so that'll be 45 minutes. And if you have any questions, just throw them up in chat, and, and Michael will get to them uh, at, at the end of his session. And then we're going to do a 45 minute uh, drawing session. Um, and uh, for those of you who've, who've done it before, you, you know how it goes. I, uh, I show you some examples and we talk a little bit about what we're going to draw. And then I've got a couple of fabulous, fabulous pictures of Hazel that we'll use um, to do some sketching from. Now, uh, my rule is always, you don't have to show anybody what you're working on with sketching. So even if you're really here just to hear what Michael has to say, um, and, and you're not sure about the sketching bit, um, you can at least, you know, you can watch and see what goes on. Uh, nobody will ask to see your art or anything of that sort. And, um, and I send a PDF around uh, afterwards of, of the bit I show, and I'm recording all of this um, so that uh, we can, uh, if, if Michael wants to show this at, on YouTube or something, and I want to put my bit on YouTube, you guys can all see it again later. So with that, um, let me just tell you how I met Michael in the first place when I was a caretaker out on Nashawina. He was uh, working with trustees of reservations and came out to monitor the, the conservation restriction on the island. And we got to know each other. And as one does and develops a, a network, um, I, I became very interested as he moved into his, the next part of his career to do this logging. So I'm going to go ahead and let Michael take over. Okay, great. Oops, so okay. Go ahead. Sorry, yeah. Michael. <laughs> no, that's totally fine. So hello, everyone. I'll share my screen in just a moment, and then it'll take away the need to have me be big and blown up. But thank you very much for having me. I hope this is interesting. Um, and thank you for attending tonight. Um, so I'm going to talk tonight about horse logging and why I got into it and why anyone would do it sort of ever. <laughs> Um, and uh, hopefully uh, you come away sort of learning something about the practice and, and maybe, you know, wanting, wanting to get interested in, in learning more later. Um, but so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. So, um, hi, my name is Michael Madol. I'm in Plainfield, Massachusetts, which is up in the hill towns uh, of Western Mass, sort of between the Berkshires and the Pioneer Valley. And this is Hazel uh, right here on the right of the screen. And she's an 18 year old Belgian mare. And she is a logging horse and she's been logging for longer than I've known what horse logging is. And since way before I ever picked up a chainsaw. Um, and I'll talk more about how I met Hazel uh, later on. Um, but this is us actually on our first day together, like working together uh, as a team. I had saved up all of my pennies and I had begged, borrowed, and stolen like, uh, to, to get a deal with the next door neighbor to house Hazel because I was living in an apartment. And, um, you know, I had invested all of the time in. Um, building housing and, and stuff like that. And so finally Hazel arrived and we were ready to go into the woods and I put her harness on and uh, we were going towards the woods and she just stopped dead right in between the field and the woods because she knew if she kept walking, she would have to go to work and she would not walk into the woods <laughs> and she would not listen to me. And I had worked so hard to get to that point and then she just wouldn't go. And you don't want to yell at a horse and you don't want to scare a horse, but you also don't want to let a horse get away with something like that. <laughs> so, uh, because then she would think she was the boss. And so what I had to end up doing, uh, what I ended up doing was actually turning her 
backwards so that her butt was facing the forest and walking her backwards 30 yards through the woods because that's the only thing you can really get a horse to do um, is get them to walk backwards with these lines. So I walked her backwards into the forest and when she, uh, uh, when she realized that I wasn't gonna give up, she turned around and we were able to haul a couple of logs out that day. That was sort of the beginning of our relationship and everything since then has been sort of a, that theme. <laughs> so um, almost all the stories, Elizabeth, as, as I was thinking about this, you were like, hey, bring stories. Almost all of my stories are her doing something like that. Like just saying like, I don't think I want to do that today. And then me trying to figure out how we can maybe get something accomplished. And so this, um, this is a hobby. Uh, I think Elizabeth said I changed careers, but I did not change careers to this. Uh, this is something, this is a passion, and this is something that my career supplements. And one of the things that I really don't want to do today is give you the impression that this is the only right way to do logging. Um, I don't want to give you the impression that logging with horses is the only, you know, um, uh, environmentally friendly way to do logging. There are many ways that you can do logging. And uh, this is a particularly low impact way of doing it. But there are really talented loggers all over the state who would love to use horses, but they can't because they have to make a living out of it. I have the luxury of having a full-time job um, running, I have a land conservation software company that I run with my partner and uh, my business partner. And uh, so this is very much a labor of love. Um, but uh, I'll, I'll talk more about why someone would log with horses a little bit um, later on. And hopefully by giving talks like this, I can sort of raise awareness of horse logging and maybe more people can get interested and maybe loggers can start to make a living doing this. Um, but right now it's really, really hard to do. And so before I tell you more Hazel stuff, I sort of want to talk about why someone would horse log in the first place. And so what you're seeing right now, you shouldn't be hearing any audio. This is just a, a silent video going through a forest. This is a really typical Massachusetts forest. It's middle-aged um, uh, with a nice diverse um, sort of understory here. There are plants coming in in the understory. These sugar maples are really beautiful, but some of them have been damaged. You can see right down at the bottom, this uh, tree has a scar down here. And so if left alone, right, these trees would all grow big and tall. Uh, storms would knock them over. More trees would come in uh, in the undergrowth. But what happens if you need to harvest these trees for any reason? And there are any number of reasons why you might need to harvest a tree. Maybe you want to um, get some firewood or maybe you need some timber. And if you can get it from your own backyard, there's really no more sustainable way of doing it. And if you can get just the one tree that you're after uh, and touch nothing else, um, then that is right the best way of all um and so horse logging is all about sort of going in doing this sort of surgical extraction of trees just walking weaving in between these trees getting uh the smaller stuff the shorter stuff the damaged stuff and leaving behind these big beautiful trees to grow and sequester a lot of carbon right and um uh, and do their jobs and so this can continue to be a great, big, beautiful forest. Um, this doesn't have to be done with horses. Loggers can do this. It's just horses are exceptionally um, low impact. And so what I am not is I am not a forester. I don't, I'm not licensed to practice forestry. And a forester in Massachusetts is someone who comes out and develops a forest management plan and then works with a logger, a timber harvester, to execute that forest management plan. And um, so that's what I do. I'm a logger and I am licensed to harvest timber in Massachusetts. You pass a little test uh, to make sure you know the rules, 
But to be honest, my jobs have been so small that no one cares if I have a license or not uh, because I don't meet the threshold. And so this is just a uh, really nice illustration of what forests do. Uh, so uh, if left to their own devices. So this giant big branchy pine was naturally weak because it grew in the open. It snapped over, left a nice big light, uh, uh, a nice big area up there for the light to come in and then uh, leave space for this oak to come in and take its place. So all I'm doing is uh, mimicking this natural process of succession. And so as time goes on, parcels in Massachusetts get smaller, but the equipment for harvesting trees gets bigger. And so what horses are, are sort of a reasonably sized tool for some of these smaller parcels. Um, uh, because as the equipment gets bigger, it's really, it means that there are fewer and fewer tools to go onto these smaller parcels and extract timber for those, for the landowner um, uh, or for uh, timber sale. And so this is uh, what it looks like in practice. So uh, this is, uh, so that was Hazel who you saw just now, uh, her face. And this is sort of a, a best case scenario. This is on our lot here in Plainfield. And you can see these big giant trees here in the background. And then these tiny trees. Some of these are developing sugar maples that I want to grow into big trees by the time I'm a hundred and something. <laughs> um, and so we harvested an ash back here. You could see how she was able to weave her way through the trees to get to that ash that we cut down for firewood. And so now what I'm gonna, so now I've chopped that tree up into segments and I'm going to put a chain around that tree and I'm gonna lead Hazel to it and she's going to pretend like she's going to walk away there. I'm sorry if it's a little small, um, but what I just did was attach the chain to the tree, and now I'm going to turn her around, and she's going to start acting a fool. You can see she's getting ready to um, hitch to a load, which normally makes her kind of antsy, unless we've been working a lot. She tends to get really, you can see her feet are starting to move. She's tossing her head. She's getting ready. And the best practice is really for me not to pull while she's doing it, but to give her a second to calm down. And so with a single horse, you can really weave in between the trees and really barely leave a trace. And so we're just about to get going there in just a moment. And uh, so there you saw it move off the log. And now uh, she's pulling it out. And this is a tiny log for her. This is a, really a tiny pull. But she's being very dramatic. She's being very strong. And uh, you can see there, as I go around that tree, um, I'm able to sort of weave out of that spot. Let me sort of jump forward here. So I'm able to weave in between these trees that I don't want to touch quite yet and get that log um, out. And so that's what we do. That's what a horse is really able to do um, very, very well. And uh, so this is sort of a more zoomed out view. Um, and uh, it's, a, it's an uphill skid, which isn't ideal. Normally she likes to go downhill, but it is on ice uh, and snow, as long as the snow isn't too deep. Uh, it's pretty good. And so um, the way I got into horse logging, um, I found out about horse logging eight years ago after I moved to Massachusetts. I grew up in Texas, far away from any big trees or anything that looked remotely like this. Uh, but when I moved to Massachusetts, I ended up um, moving in next to a horse powered farm out here in the hill towns called Natural Roots, where they use horses. And um, I thought it was the most amazing thing I'd ever seen in my life, but I knew I was never gonna be a farmer. That was not my jam. Uh, I can't grow things. I didn't really have any interest in it. And um, 
you know, but the, the part of working with horses just seemed amazing. I had kept livestock before as a, at a rescue sanctuary as a zookeeper. And I really loved that, but I didn't really know how I could practically work, work horses into my life. But then um, David Fisher, who owns Natural Roots, that horsepower farm, told me that his favorite thing to do was log with horses. And I was like, what's logging? <laughs> and he was like, oh, <laughs> you, should, you should come by sometime in the winter. And so um, I was able to see him work with his team in the woods. Uh, and by team, I mean two horses, usually with what's called an arch, which is something to lift the logs off the ground, gives the horses a mechanical advantage. And um, so the, um, so I thought it was the most beautiful thing I'd ever seen. I thought it was really remarkable and I really wanted to figure out how to do it. And so I found someone to teach me. Uh, so I apprenticed with a guy named Brad Johnson for a summer. Uh, he works up in Vermont. He's one of the few uh, uh, individuals that I know who logs full time with a team and makes a living out of it. It's really, really hard to do. He runs a hybrid operation now with a small forwarder and with a tractor, but he does use the horses to, for the extraction part for short skids. And so I learned with him for a summer and it was a real crash course. And Hazel was one of the team that I learned on with Brad. So it was Hazel and this horse named Bob. And Hazel was always the one that was trying to get me into trouble. Um, and so one of the only times I ever really had sort of a scary experience with this, and I'll talk more about the risks in a while, was when I was on the landing, which is where you stack the logs, and I hadn't unhitched the log yet. And it was still, so it was still hitched to Hazel and Bob. And Hazel decided she was gonna head back home while my foot was in a bad position. And she ended up uh, dragging the log into my foot and pinning me onto the landing in between two giant pine logs. And uh, so I got out of that scrape. It was, everything was fine. That's why you wear steel-toed boots. And, um, uh, but when Brad told me a few years later that he was selling Hazel, I was like, no way. <laughs> like That horse has it in for me. But the more I thought about it, the more I thought, you know, uh, she's the right size. She's actually quite small for a draft horse. I know her owner. I know she's very healthy. And I know she'll be a good horse for me to learn on because she won't do everything I ask her to. And so um, Hazel and I, I ended up purchasing Hazel from Brad because he needed a horse that was a little bit younger and a little bit more spry. And so this is really Hazel's semi-retirement uh, job because I only work her um, in the summer hardly at all. Uh, I just drive her around to pick up her own manure. I have a little thing that I hitch her to and we pick up manure and she drags it down. But um, in the winter is really when we tend to um, uh, pick up steam, maybe have a couple jobs. And so most of the year she just gets to be lazy and hang out with her companion animal, Abby, who's a little miniature goat who lives here with us. Um, and they make a pretty hilarious team. And so um, it took me, uh, you know, two or three years to learn all the chainsaw skills and the horse logging skills necessary to do this. Uh, and then there was the reading part. There was learning about forest management, forest succession, ecology. When I started, I didn't know what an oak tree looked like, you know, versus a pine tree. Honestly, I didn't know the difference. Um, uh, and so learning all the trees was a major part of it, learning how those trees work in an ecosystem. Um, it's really been a wonderful journey. It's like learning. Um, and so, um, uh, we do most of our work in the winter, like I said, and so she gets these special winter shoes. Uh, she's only shod once a year. The rest of the time, shod means she has shoes. She only has shoes for about um, six weeks out of the year, uh, sort of in the depths of winter when we might be doing most of our work. And what these shoes do is it, you can see that they're actually resting on top of this layer of ice 
And if she didn't have these shoes and she tried to pull, pull a log, it would be really, really dangerous for her because she wouldn't have any gripping strength. These shoes actually make her a good two inches taller and it's noticeable when I'm standing next to her. Um, one time uh, I wasn't quite used to her and how, like how she sort of moved around and she actually stepped on my foot with those shoes on. And they have these hard borium cleats that went straight through my steel toe and actually got stuck to my shoe. And uh, she ended, so I ended up getting stuck to her foot. And then she was like, what's on my foot? And I was like, it's me. And it, so um, that was kind of spooky, but uh, I ended up uh, extracting myself and no one got hurt. Um, uh, so she has these uh, funky shoes. And so horse logging is a really slow process. Uh, it is uh, very, <laughs> um, uh, it takes us a long time to uh, do what we do. Uh, so this is a sped up clip, obviously. We don't, we don't move quite this fast. Um, uh, but uh, you, the length of time it takes is really dependent on how far we need to drag the log, um, how wet the ground is, um, and uh, conditions like that. So if we only have 10 feet to go, you know, it's, it's all pretty quick. But if we have to march across a field, in this case, the field was really wet, and so the tractor couldn't come down here and drag these out. And so we just dragged them up to a drier portion of the field um, up there. And so um, it being a really slow process means that this is sort of the product of a particularly productive um, morning. Uh, so, um, <clears throat> you know, uh, this will be one chord, maybe two. Uh, but this is a pretty, pretty good haul. So we're looking at all the logs here. Um, this is felling and dragging about 200 yards. So, um, uh, you know, most loggers would look at this and this would be, um, you know, a couple hours, maybe an hour. Uh, a, for a whole tree harvester, this would be five minutes. Um, and so it's, it's really slow, right? You have to be willing to put up with it taking time. Um, and so tree felling is a major part of this. I did a course called Game of Logging, uh, which I really highly recommend for anyone learning or hoping to learn how to fell trees. Game of Logging was, uh, has its origins in Sweden, and it's all about safety and control. And uh, they do offer courses with Northeast Woodland Training in Vermont. And uh, there are all different kinds of courses that you can take. There's storm cleanup, basic felling, basic safety. And I took uh, as many as I could. And so what the course, courses teach you are really how to control what you're doing in the woods. So in this case, we want this tree to fall right in the gap to the upper left of the screen, not anywhere else. I don't want it to hit this nice wildlife snag. I don't want it to get hung in these trees right here, which incidentally is kind of what happens. So what I'm doing is I'm using a wedge and to push the tree in the right direction. I'm also using um, uh, a technique where you make a, a series of cuts to sort of direct the tree uh, in the proper direction. If I wasn't able to do this, uh, I would get a lot more hangups. Hangups still happen, but hangups are take time to get down, right? If this tree falls into the one next door to it, it's gonna take me a long time to get it out, especially with just a horse. Um, and so eventually what happens here, we zoom to the end, is uh, if you wedge a tree and you know where the tree is gonna go, you can really control when it falls and you can really minimize the danger as much as possible. And so I was well away from this tree when it finally fell. Hazel was far, far away and uh, it was all done in a controlled fashion. But you can see from the start of this video to the end, here in the middle of the screen is the top of the tree, and then near the end, it's way over here. So it's just a process of getting the tree to lean in the right direction until eventually it falls. When it does fall, it pays to have a horse that uh, doesn't jump. Uh, so <laughs> Hazel is really used to logging, and so right now, this tree over on the left of the screen is going to fall, and 
she doesn't care at all. <laughs> so she barely flinches um, because she's been around it for now 12 years. There are things that make her flinch. She is not bomb proof, uh, you know, and the things that make her run away can be really silly seeming to us. So like, I'm sure if I blew up a balloon, like she would probably run away from that balloon because she didn't know what it was. Uh, I just purchased a brand new horse trailer and uh, surprise, surprise, she doesn't want to have anything to do with it. <laughs> so it's all, you know, it's, it's, sometimes it can be hard to tell what she's going to be scared of, but trees falling, chainsaws running uh, are not one of those things. And so safety is a big thing that people like to talk about. They like to talk about how dangerous horse logging is. And, and like I said, I really like to minimize risk. I'm not a very like adrenaline seeking individual. <laughs> I don't really like the dangerous aspects of doing this. And so I try to minimize them as much as possible. What you're looking at here is you can see there's a log at, on the lower left of the screen that came off, but up on, sort of on the center right, that's where the stump is where I felled this tree. And so what happened was this actually jumped off of this stump, uh, flew through the air to the left and slammed into this tree right here. And luckily because of my training, um, because I was properly taught, I knew that was gonna be, uh, I knew that was gonna happen and I was far away from it um, when it did happen. So I have a certain set of tools that I use in the woods that are really, I don't think anyone else uses them. I worked with it. Uh, I worked as a tree climber for a while and I learned to use ropes and rigging uh, to my advantage. And so this blue rope here has a five ton breaking strength and it's really, really useful for dragging things out of hard to get to locations. Uh, there are some pulleys here in the center that um, I use to get mechanical advantage. And so this is actually what I bring with me into the woods to help us get our job done. So here's a photo, there's Hazel waiting in the upper left. But what I've done here is, is um, actually uh, rigged up something. These trees were all down sort of in a hole where Hazel couldn't get, but I was able to rig up a rope and um, uh, pulley for mechanical advantage to drag these logs out of that hole. And then I could just hitch Hazel to them and pull them the rest of the way. Um, and I should say, of course, Hazel was pulling the rope. And so, was there a question? Or did someone just unmute themselves? It sounds like someone unmuted themselves. That's fine. Um, so, uh, this was our biggest pull to date. People often ask, how much she can pull. Uh, and this is about as much as she can pull. And she pulled this out of, again, uh, the, this is sort of a downhill, a hole that I needed to get this log out of. And so this was probably 1500 pounds uphill um, and it, which is basically her entire body weight. Uh, and this is not an insignificant thing. And knowing that she could do this um, and, you know, not worrying about hurting her in the process is, is part of learning. Knowing when to quit is also a part of learning. Um, but I'm just really proud of this picture. I'm really proud of her uh, for doing this. You can see she's covered in sweat <laughs> from, from doing this. And so after this, we just bucked it up and then we took it up uh, in, took these bucked up sections in um, bucking, sorry, bucking is the technical term for uh, turning into these firewood sized logs. And so we just moved the firewood sized logs up the hill from there. And so um, from here, it's just sort of pretty pictures <laughs> that I've taken uh, from my experiences with her. And I have some thoughts on sort of horse logging. And um, so when I was first getting into this, uh, I thought I needed to be a forester. I thought I needed to go back to school and get a license. And so I went and met with this great guy named Dave Kittredge, um, who has since passed away, but he used to work at UMass. And I went to him uh, sort of asking him which courses I should sign up for. And he said, uh, oh, um, you know, after 30 minutes, he said, I, I don't think you want to enroll here. I think what you want to do is go buy a chainsaw and learn 
how to be a horse logger uh, because I thought I needed to be a forester to be to work with horses. And he pointed out that all I needed to really do was just go out and try to do it. Um, he also pointed out that um, I wasn't horse logging wasn't a way exactly to make a living. It was more of a way of life, um, and that's something that I still think about all the time. Um, as you know, we've moved out here to the country now. We have a place for the horse, and um, a lot of what I do day to day is just keeping this animal and keeping her healthy and moving hay and getting hay and building enclosures and keeping Abby safe, her little goat friend. Um, and so it really is something you have to buy into entirely um, in order to make it work. Uh, but it is not uh, the most expensive thing in the world, actually keeping a horse. Um, and uh, if you're willing to put in the labor uh, to save some money, uh, it, it can be done. And I was really lucky along the way uh, to have friends who like um, allowed me to get started on their land rather than needing to purchase our own. Um, and <laughs> so uh, we've been really lucky. This photo actually shows a, a bad habit of hers. Uh, you can see on the tree trunk, I have to be careful about what I tie her to um, because uh, she tends to chomp whatever tree <laughs> I tie her to. And so the low impact nature of what we're doing, uh, you know, we actually are leaving a little sign there in terms of like hazel, hazel's bite marks on these trees. This was a pretty miserable day. Uh, you know, you can see it's sort of that like, kind of late winter mush rain stuff. It's like 40 degrees and so everything is wet. Um, uh, but she was, she was pretty patient uh, that day. Some days she just stands there in the woods while I get trees hung up and then I have to get them down. Um, sort of a, one of the first things I learned sort of in keeping with that first story of her not going into the woods was Every day starts with losing all of my expectations of what are gonna, what's gonna happen that day. And so I sort of have to let go of like the idea that we're gonna get anything done and just march into the woods and hope for the best. But sometimes she just ends up watching me. Um, you know, uh, she has a hay bag here so she can munch away. And then maybe we pull one log and then call it a day. Um, you know, sometimes my mood just isn't there. Uh, and I can tell that we're not going to work well together that day and she's getting on my nerves and I just need to call it quits and we go back to the barn. Um, it's always a process of learning. And as time has gone by, I really gotten better at reading her. Um, half of what was going wrong in the beginning or what I thought was going wrong was just my inability to read her signs and to give her proper cues when she was expecting them. Um, and so now I've gotten really good at staying out of her way when she puts her feet down. I've gotten really good at, uh, you know, telling when she's about to move, when she, when I can just drop the reins, uh, we call them lines, but when I can drop the reins and, and just leave her and I know when she's going to stand still or when I need to actually tie her up to a hitch or to a post, tie her to a tree and then go do what I need to do. I know when we need to call it quits and maybe also when we need to power through a little bit. I know when she needs encouragement and when she actually can't pull what she's trying to pull. Um, and it's a continual process of learning. I'm a very green teamster still. I could not train a horse. I would be nervous to work with any other horse other than Hazel right now, to be honest, because I've just gotten so used to her but I'm gonna to have to learn one day. Um, and so uh, this is just pretty picture that I took. Uh, it's all really beautiful work and I'm really lucky to get it, get to do it as a hobby. Um, I get to hang out with horses and um, uh, see beautiful things and go to beautiful places and hopefully have a positive impact on uh, the world. 
And so uh, next up for us, for Hazel and Mrs. Abby and me is hopefully expanding little by little every year. Um, so what I would really like to do is purchase a big piece of equipment. Uh, so I need to, which is actually a small piece of equipment, I need to get a small forwarder, which I can attach to my truck so I can load firewood on um, and move it, you know, uh, from locations that she can drag it to. Um, so small equipment like that is really rare in Massachusetts. Like I said, people tend to buy big so they can get big loads and then sell it because um, the margins are so thin. Um, but I'm sort of trying the opposite tack, staying small and supplementing this stuff. So uh, hopefully in a few years, we're able to save up enough pennies to um, you know, buy some more equipment and keep expanding really, really slowly. Um, uh, maybe by then we'll have different horse, um, but uh, really remains to be seen. Um, so right now I'm happy to answer questions. We've got like six minutes left, I think, of my allotted time. Um, so uh, I can check out the chat if that works. Um, Elizabeth, is that the best? Uh, Way to do it. Yeah, sure. They all need to. Thank you. Sorry, sounds like. So I'm happy to read the chat questions um, and uh, and go through those. And if we have any uh, time afterwards, I can answer any other questions. Does that work, Elizabeth? That sounds perfect. Okay, great. So hello, Buckland neighbor. Thanks for joining. <laughs> um, uh, Buckland is a town right around the corner. Uh, we actually lived there when we were in Apple Valley at Redgate Farm uh, before we moved to Plainfield. Um, so how much horse experience did I previously have? None, aside from when I apprenticed with Brad to learn with the team. Um, and so I didn't start working with horses until my late 20s. I'm 34 now. Um, and so I learned as I was going and I was really lucky to have some amazing teachers along the way. Uh, thanks for saying it would make a nice book. That's very sweet. Um, do I give Hazel a reward for doing a good job? Yes. The guy I learned from, although it's a very tiny reward and she probably doesn't think about it like that. I say thank you and I give her scratches, which like I scratch her belly. Um, I learned that from Brad Johnson, the guy I learned from. He has since told me that some people look askance at thanking their horses, but I feel like it is only the right thing to do, um, especially when she tries really hard. When she is being a pain, I do not thank her as much. Um, but, uh, ooh, do I ever ride Hazel? Yes, occasionally she can be ridden, and Brad had a daughter who loved to ride her. Unfortunately, I don't have a saddle and she is very broad backed. And so when I get up to a canter, I tend to start falling off. And um, also I find it really scary because she's really tall and I'm not used to riding. Again, I didn't have any horse experience. And so like maybe occasionally I hop on her. Uh, you can hop up on her back and she doesn't care. Sometimes I do that just for fun, just to hang out with her, but um, she can be ridden, yes. Does Hazel follow one word commands? Yes, but it turns out she's not a very, she doesn't really respond to those commands, G and ha. G meaning right, ha meaning left. Um, when I started, I was watching videos, getting ready for this presentation, and I'm always shouting like, G, Hazel, come on, G, and she's not doing it. And I'm like, and I'm looking at the videos, and I'm like, right, because I wasn't giving her the right signals with the lines. Now when we go into the woods, it's pretty quiet. I've found that she, we work best together if I tell her, whoa, to stop, get up to go, and then we're quiet the rest of the time. She's done this so many times that if I start talking to her instead of just using the lines, we tend to both get confused and really like anxious and we trip over each other. So it's really very quiet. Um, but she is very good at, whoa, she's very good at stopping, and she's very good at um, going. 
Uh, Libby Mueller asks, does your farrier make Hazel's shoes? Yes, um, although we did have to enlist a friend to weld on those giant cleats. Uh, he, the farrier, who a farrier is someone who does, makes horseshoes and puts horseshoes on horses. Um, uh, the farrier uh, did get those made special. Did I try most of my logging? Do I try to do most of it before the snow flies? Do I log most of the winter? Deep snow is bad. Um, a little bit of snow on frozen ground is just beautiful. It's ideal. Um, frozen ground is getting rarer and rarer, as you all know. Uh, it's a huge problem for loggers because historically logging takes place when the ground is frozen. I think two years ago, the ground didn't freeze at all in Southern Massachusetts. Um, that ground freezing hardens things up and protects the earth from erosion. And so we do try to do most of our work when the ground is frozen, at least. If the snow is more than 20 inches, it can be sort of a slog the first few pulls. And if it's deeper than like two feet, I tend to not bother. Um, but winter is definitely our active time, not least because she is very sensitive to bugs. She hates them. And you know what? I hate them too. And so <laughs> if we can concentrate our work when there are no bugs, that's, that's ideal for everyone. Um, so any other, any other questions? I think we're right at time. Um, so uh, thanks everyone for your time. I think uh, I'm gonna stop sharing now. Thank uh, you. It was fantastic. Thank you so much. <laughs> there we go. Okay. So wasn't that fantastic? Uh, who knew? <laughs> and so Hazel, uh, luckily for us, um, we've got some good photos, so we don't have to worry about her standing still. And so I'm going to, for the next 45 minutes, uh, we'll do this uh, sketching and drawing horses. Um, I'm using Hazel as a model, but at the same time, I'm going to be talking about horses in general. So just to start off with, um, I'll be going through some uh, examples of artwork so you can sort of see what other people do when it comes to sketching. Now, I will say, and uh, those of you who've had any of my art classes before know this, there's a limited amount you can get done in even a 45-minute uh, class. So don't, don't stress out about that. I'll send the PDF uh, of all of the images I show you, including the reference material that we'll use to draw Hazel, so that you can draw more carefully on your own time if you want to. So, you know, just try to get the basics down, understand sort of uh, what the process is, and, and we'll sort of go from there. Okay, so let me, oh, 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 I told, I said I had some big news. And so for those of you who are interested, um, I've talked to Anne at the library, and I think we're going to do another summer of drawing. <laughs> so that will start sometime uh, in May or June. Well, um, Anne is uh, playing all of the videos from last year's um, 20, 20 classes, uh, one at a time, starting right after, um, after the new year. So they're playing them at the library every Sunday uh, afternoon. And as soon as those finish and get up to 20, we'll start the next week with the next classes. Now, these are going to be more advanced drawing classes. So all of you folks who've been through the initial classes will uh, have the basics, and everyone else can uh, go to my YouTube channel and, and get that uh, information and, and be caught up and ready to go. So more information on that to come. And right now, we'll deal with just drawing horses. <laughs> Let me go ahead and uh, screen share. Let's see. Oh, I think I managed to, hang on one second. I think I managed to close down the, um, just one second here. I managed to close down my, uh, ah, there we go. Okay. All right, I'm coming right back again. I don't know why. Let's see. Let's see what's going on here. Okay, I think I've got this set. Let's go to slideshow and see from the beginning. Okay, there we go. This is more like it. All right, so sketching with Hazel. Um, whoop, <laughs> it's going by itself. Okay, so sketching with Hazel, and of course the photos uh, are courtesy of, of Michael. Uh, Hilltown Horse Logging is his business name, and I'll make sure that in the PDF I include his contact information. 
So this, this little picture here, some of you have seen before, this was me drawing a horse at age three years. So regardless of where you start with drawing horses, uh, you know, a, a few years ago, I was able to do something more like this. So there's, there is a progression that you can make from, from the most basic to, to something a little bit more horse-like. And I mention this because drawing horses is really complex. Uh, you know, there's a lot to them, you know, four legs to start off with, not just two like a person. Um, and their, their body shape is not the same type of body that we look at in the morning. So when you're trying to do something like, you know, uh, draw horses or draw animals of any sort, it's useful, not always necessary, but useful to have a little bit of understanding of what the skeletal structure is like. So for a horse, if you're looking at it from the side, you see the very strong neck, the big rib cage, uh, you know, the, the vertebrae is very strong. But what really tells you more about uh, what a horse looks like uh, is the musculature because you see all of those enormous muscles that make up the neck, that make up the back, uh, the, the upper legs and allow uh, a horse to jump and, and run the way that it does. So this is not, you don't have to know all of this to draw horses, but if you start to draw horses more, you'll find this information really useful because it can be difficult to see just from the surface exactly what's going on with a horse. Now, <laughs> there's also a lot of terminology very little of which I'm going to be using in this class today. Uh, I think sometimes it's a little overwhelming to people when they get started um, drawing horses or, or riding or, or anything to do with horses, um, all of these uh, specific terms to describe this, that, and the other. So I'm going to try to describe horses today in very, very simple terms, uh, but this will be there for your reference. One thing I am going to um, do, though, is talk about an, an art term that I use a lot, which is talking about the planes, the planes on the surface of, of the horse. So planes are like, like facets on the gemstone. If you, if you take a horse, like you see on the right here, and you sort of boil down the, the facets of that horse, of, of the way the head is shaped, uh, you get something a little bit more geometric, like what we're seeing over here on the left. So this is important information when you're talking about how the light is falling, for example, on a horse, um, or how uh, we view a, um, a horse as it moves um, from one aspect to another. We see different planes of the horse. So that's just a bit of terminology that I use. And you can really sort of see that in these 3D models. Um, this is the type of wireframe that somebody who is doing, for example, video games or that sort of thing uses to, to create a horse that they can then move in 3D. And each one of these little shapes that you see, um, those are represent different planes of, of the horse as, uh, as the body moves around the stomach, the back to the front, uh, up the neck. And so you can see that there's a lot of complexity that goes on. Though all of those muscles have form and they have various different planes that catch the light in different ways. And these ways, unless you spend a lot of time around horses, when you start looking at horses to draw them, this stuff is pretty unfamiliar. So as we look at a horse from the side and then it sort of rotates around and we see it from the back and from the front, uh, there are many different changes to the body in terms of, of getting more round, getting more rectangular. Um, when you look at a horse from the back, that's pretty much a, a skinny rectangle that's quite vertical, quite different than what you might think when you look at sort of the barrel shape of the ribs. So familiarity is really, there really aren't any sort of tricks to uh, drawing horses, but familiarity helps a lot. So whether you're using photographs or models like this, the more you actually can spend some time drawing horses on your own, you know, with as, taking as much time as you want, the easier it will be when you get into a situation where you need to draw or sketch a horse really quickly, the, the more information you'll already have at your fin fingertips ready to do that. So I mention that because here's Edward Manet, a famous impressionist artist, and here is him sketching extremely quickly uh, this particular carriage. And uh, Le Fiacre, uh, that, that um, is the, the type of um, 
I guess uh, I'm not quite sure. I think it's a hackney cab um, that, that he is drawing right here. But you see that horse, right? I mean, we know it's a horse, but that is done extremely quickly. And for most of us, especially with the way horses move, um, that is about as much of a sketch as you can get down. But in the observation, even of a situation like this, where he's just trying to get this little scene, if you've got a little bit of information to start with, and you can uh, you know, even sketch a horse like this, now we have the advantage of having our, our phone cameras, and we can take a picture as well to go along with it. But this helps you get a sense of a, of a scene. So I wanted to start off with this by saying that every horse drawing does not have to be really detailed and photorealistic. It can be a sketch just like this. And so one of the things that, uh, um, whoops, let me just go back, Edward Manet with, and, and Degas uh, and uh, a number of other of the Impressionists um, hung out around the race courses quite a bit and did a lot of sketching of the horses in motion. And this, uh, this sketch that um, Edward Manet did for um, a painting that I'll show you in just a second, it, it's Sure, it's about, we, we can see these are horses coming down the track, but it's as much the feeling of horses racing as it is the actual horses, uh, you know, how, how are the uh, hooves moving, what is the body doing? And so, likewise, when he went in and created a painting from a number of sketches that he did, uh, these are, you know, um, most of us know that these hooves probably don't move exactly the way he's showing them here. Um, but he's definitely given us the idea of the excitement of the race. And likewise, Edgar Degas, another fellow who would hang out at the races quite a bit. Now, he's got a much more uh, flat, not lots of detail. He's really concentrating on the silhouette of the horses. So if you squint your eyes just a little bit and have a look at these horses, you can tell they're horses from the overall form, not necessarily the detail. So just like Manet was concentrating on the movement and the feeling of horses racing, Degas is concentrating on the overall shape, not necessarily all the detail of the musculature and that sort of thing. So these are just different ways to approach drawing horses. Um, these folks also spent a lot of time trying to draw horses in motion, um, watching how they moved, uh, you know, spending time, uh, of course, at, at the time, if you have horse-drawn carriages and you have people owning horses and you have horses at the races, there's a lot more opportunity than perhaps we have today to actually get the same information. But the, the point is, the more sketching that you can do of horses, whether from photographs initially and then from life, the better you'll get. Some more, some more sketches, some, some better than others, some obviously done on the fly. Um, and I'm, I'm showing this to you to give you confidence, because regardless of how your sketches turn out, uh, you know, as we all know, Degas paintings sell for millions of dollars now. And this is how he started uh, doing preparations for, for, his, uh, for his paintings and such. At the same time, um, you know, beautiful, beautiful scenes like this, just really wonderful, um, showed his love for horses and his familiarity with their behavior. So uh, you can spend a lot more time on a drawing. You don't have to do a quick sketch. You can certainly take your time to, to measure out all of the proportions and do a, do a beautifully toned uh, drawing like this or, or a lithograph. Um, I mean, this is just gorgeous, very lyrical. Uh, here's another one that he did, um, a drawing horse with saddle and bridle. You know, this is obviously something that took a while. We know from sketching that in 15 minutes, all you can really do is, is get a, a really kind of rough idea of an animal. So, you know, if you have an hour or two to draw much more carefully, you can do something of this as well. And let's not uh, forget Leonardo da Vinci. We'll throw a little bit of that in. So, you know... Every artist who has been interested in horses <laughs> has had to do the same sort of thing. Start from the beginning, figure out, you know, how is that horse standing? What is the shading looking? How is the light hitting the different planes of the horse to create shading and, and highlights in different places? So 
what I think happens to most of us is, you know, we see a horse like Hazel and, and she's so beautiful. And we say to ourselves, oh, we definitely would like to draw that. And we take a photo, but it's overwhelming. There's so much information there. Um, not only are we not necessarily familiar with the shape of a horse, but there's all this other stuff as well. Um, it, it adds to the beauty of the scene, all of the equipment that she's wearing, um, her beautiful mane and tail, uh, the, the scene as a whole. But it's, it's a little distracting when, when you're starting to sketch. So rather than starting with something like this, what, I, what we're going to do today is we're going to start uh, with this, the, the unclothed hazel, <laughs> and, and also drawing her from the side. So as I talk, what I'd like you to do is just start off, you know, take a minute to actually look at Hazel. Look at, look at how her head is, look at how the neck goes, look at how her body is and her legs. Um, you know, sort of the overall, she's a very sturdy animal. Um, you can sort of see the weight of her body being held by those really strong legs. She's got, from the side, her, her face uh, has, has a lot of depth to it. Her, her head has a lot of depth to it. So just go ahead and make a few lines on your paper that just sort of indicate the large areas, the large areas of her, her head, of the front of her body, that kind of interesting arc that comes down. Um, and as we go along, we'll refine this. But one thing I want to mention, and some of you um, who have not taken art classes with me before um, may not have, have uh, come across this before, but if when I say here about checking the angles. What I'm talking about is when you put a, a, a line down um, indicating perhaps the back of her neck, what you can do is you can hold up your pen, maybe even squint with one eye closed, and check the angle of the back of, of her neck, for example, and then without moving, without uh, changing the angle of your pen, pull your hand over to your page and double check that angle. And you can do that for the front of her head, Pull your hand over to your uh, paper and check that angle. This is a way, this is a really useful tool that I use for drawing everything from people to boats to whatever. I try first just to eyeball it because I'm trying to train my eye to look, uh, to get those angles right from the start. But then I double check by using my, my pen or pencil or paintbrush and I just Without moving the, the angle of my paintbrush or, or, or pencil, I move it right back over to my um, drawing pad or, or the canvas I'm working on, and I check to see if I got that angle right. Now, one of the reasons I do this, and I'm pretty uh, keen on doing this at the beginning of, of a drawing, is because if I don't get the angles right at the start, everything goes downhill. It's really difficult to get your proportions right if you, if you don't start off here. So, the next step, once you get those basic lines in place, and I'm going to give you a little bit more time uh, to do this next bit, is to lightly erase those initial lines and start adding in more accurate lines describing Hazel's proportions. I also usually at this point, I know that I'm not perfectly accurate, but I try to mark some of those major uh, bumps and indentations as well. So. Once you get used to uh, the anatomy of a horse and drawing horses more frequently, you'll, you'll be a lot more familiar with how they move and what you're actually seeing. But to begin with, it, even if you've never studied the anatomy of a horse and don't know any of the names of any of the parts of a horse, you can still see the light and dark areas, and you can still see that there are some protrusions, there are some, some bumps and some highlights going on. And if you just mark those on your drawing, those represent either places where muscles change direction or where bones are closer to the surface. And they start to give you a more realistic uh, feeling of, a, of a, an animal in the round. So one of the challenges, I think, when you start drawing horses, or even if you've drawn them before, but you're trying to get better at it, is to not end up doing something that's overly cartoony. Now, I spent a lot of time when I was younger drawing horses on absolutely everything. And most of the horses were more cartoony because I was drawing them out of my head. So instead of drawing a horse accurately the way I, I actually saw the horse, I was drawing basically what was a symbol of a horse um, or a, an icon that stood in for a horse. Uh, everybody would know what it was, but it was sort of a generic 
horse. It wasn't this one specific animal that we see in front of us. And so just as I don't really show people, you know, sort of a, a formula for drawing faces or whatever, you know, with an oval and then you put lines across it and then you add the eyes. I also don't do that for drawing horses either. Um, there are some, if you're drawing one out of your head, sure, there are some ways you can take, you know, a big circle to make the part of her head up near the eyes and a smaller one near the nose, et cetera, et cetera, and join them up to, to make a horse-like structure. But I think it's much more useful to have a look at the actual animal, the one specific horse you're drawing. Because as you know, each type of horse is a little bit different. Uh, even the way that uh, the, the different color will reflect light um, and show a little bit different form. At different ages, horses will look different. Uh, every different vantage point, um, their, their energy, if they're tired, if they're, if they're running, whatever, it's all different. So it's so much more accurate, uh, and, and you'll learn so much more about drawing horses if you're actually just sort of studying the one horse you see in front of you. And so the next step is to lightly erase uh, all of those lines, just sort of so you can see a little bit of them underneath. And now it's time to get things a little bit more accurate. So this business of, of erasing the lines that are underneath, I do this a lot because each time you're basically refining. The more that you look at the, at the horse or the subject, whatever it is that you're drawing, the more you start to see details. And the other thing that happens too is you start to see relationships a little bit better. So those angles you were double checking before, as you start to draw, perhaps you, you realize, hmm, in order to actually get around the bottom of, of her belly, that's actually, you know, three or four different lines, uh, different angles that I need to check to make sure I'm getting that slope just right. Likewise, her back, it's not just one line. There are maybe two or three or four different uh, changes of direction that happen. So as you're uh, trying to make your sketch a little bit more accurate, and we'll do this, uh, draw on this one for about um, five more minutes, one thing I would like you to pay attention to is how you can use a little bit of shading just to sort of start to get the sense of a horse in the round. So the first thing that you would look at would be, uh, you know, the shading um, sort of of her chest and also underneath her stomach, kind of how that, how that light doesn't get all the way around the bottom of the stomach. The, the actual, the roundness of her ribs um, catches the light on the top and then as the, the ribs sort of fall away when they get near the hind legs, you see a pretty strong shadow back there. And likewise, the far legs have shadow, either created by the, um, the, the light being stopped by her body or else just because of the, the tail or whatever that's in the way. So you've got, you have the problem when you're drawing of trying to make a horse look three-dimensional when you only have perhaps your pencil or a pen and some paper um, and you have some, some hatching to do. So this business of observing where the shadows are can be really important. And another thing that I tend to do when I'm doing a quick sketch like this, and this for me was about a 15 minute sketch. Um, I, I look at it now and go, gosh, you know, I can see some things already I could have done differently. But the idea is that if I were just watching a horse standing around, this is probably as much as I could get down on paper before that horse moved. In fact, the horse might have already moved already. And as you become more familiar with drawing horses and you sort of know how horses put their uh, legs down, you know, where the weight is carried, how they move their, their neck forward, it'll become easier for you to sort of make it up if that horse does keep on moving. And I like to also put a little bit of shadow on the ground, showing how, uh, you know, showing that the animal is standing on the ground, that there's some weight there, that there's some um, ground underneath, uh, just to kind of get a feeling of how the light was falling that day. So one thing I've spoken about before is camera distortion. You don't really see it right here because we're looking from the side, but in the next drawing that we'll do, you'll see that there's a tiny bit of distortion from the, from the camera that changes a little bit um, how, if we're gonna draw directly from the photo, um, how Hazel ends up looking. It's a little inaccurate, not enough for me to sort of, you know, tell you to change a lot of things, but one of the ways to get around having 
um, reference material that isn't accurate is to do a quick sketch like this from life and take a couple of photos, but use the sketch to help you decide what the proportions were in real life that you were looking at. Because what you see in real life will look a little bit different from what you see when you look at that photo later on your camera. So we're going to move on now. If you didn't get all the way to, to the point you'd like to uh, on this particular drawing, don't worry. Like I said, they, I'll be sending the images around, but I've got some more things to show you. So here's a good example of how when you're looking at a horse from a different direction. So this is the same horse, right? The same horse. We saw how wide her head looked from the side. But when you look at it from this angle, all of a sudden everything uh, thins down. Likewise, her body, the shape of her body is quite different. So when you're actually drawing a sort of a three quarter view of, a, of an animal like this, you want to really get that feeling of the barrel shape of her body, of how the ribs move around, of how the, there's a little bit of a, an angle to her back. There's sort of a, a little undulation of the back. And the other thing that you notice is that all of her hooves are doing different things. So the front hoof is quite a bit up. The, the one at the back on the other side is just starting to lift up. Now, this is a really, it, it's a complex thing to try to draw is, is a horse actually in any gait, whether cantering or trotting or walking. And one of the ways to sort of get your head around how this works is to, and you don't have to do this right now, but after we're off Zoom, um, is to crawl around on the floor and see and see what happens when you lift one, one of your hands up to move forward, how your back leg on the other side will follow behind it. And you'll actually use the same sort of gait that a horse would. And this sort of helps you understand how a horse is moving its weight back and forth and alternating the legs as it goes. And of course, this also applies to dogs and cats, et cetera, et cetera. And the vantage point that you're, you are actually drawing for, um, from makes a difference as well. So right now we're down basically at food bowl level um, for Hazel. And we're looking up, you know, we can see now the powerful neck we can see um, how strong those legs are. And now we can also see the distance between the front legs and the back legs and the roundness of the belly. Um, and all of these things, if, if we're observing them correctly and we're checking those angles when we draw them, will really give uh, a feeling of, of how big and strong this animal is. So this is the second, the second view of Hazel that we're going to do. Now, in this particular case, I went ahead and I, I used um, this photo for the sketch, and I uh, suggest you do as well. But you'll notice that there's a little bit of foreshortening going on because of this camera distortion, that her back end is actually a tiny bit smaller and looks a little further away than, if we, than we would see it in real life. Now, I don't feel that it was uh, enough for us not to actually uh, draw from this particular photo this time. But it is one of the reasons when you compare these sketches and, and, and this picture of Hazel to the, to the first one, there's just a little bit of a different sense um, of the power of her hindquarters in the first picture when we saw it from the side than there is from this where we see a little bit of distortion. Now, in real life, we would also get that sense of perspective. There definitely would be the, the rear of the horse sort of moving away a little bit, but it would look a little bit different. And this is why I recommend as much as possible um, drawing from life or from, from photos that are a little bit further away. So a picture of a horse that is more distant than this will have less camera distortion. Um, whereas when you get close up, kind of like when you do a selfie and your nose looks all weird, <laughs> it's the same sort of thing with the horses. So once again, go ahead and get those basic lines down, you know, double check your angles, and then a little bit more accurate. Try to get uh, some lines in there that are just a little bit more accurate. So I will also say that when you're deciding to, if, especially if you're just starting to draw horses, and this is not something you have done before, I would strongly suggest to begin with that you pick easy poses. <laughs> now, this may seem, um, you know, that may seem really obvious, but there's no doubt that the pose 
of the horse right from the side like we did first is the easiest type of horse pose to do. And the more you get around to the very front of the horse and you're looking straight on or straight from the back, the more difficult it is to really get that feeling of an, an entire body. So this sort of three quarter view is really good. Um, but what also uh, trying to draw horses that don't have saddles on, don't have bridles, don't have harnesses and all of that stuff, just to get used to how the body looks, that is really helpful as well. I also recommend when you start off, um, drawing black horses can be really difficult because it's a little bit harder than it is with a horse uh, like Hazel to sort of see how the body works, to see where the, the bumps and such are. Now, one thing that does happen when you're trying to draw a horse that has more than one color to it, and you can see like Hazel, it goes from you know the reddish color to the white. What do you do with that when you're doing a quick sketch? So as you can see on my little sketch, I usually just do a little bit of a line that kind of lightly indicates where the color change was. And I do this in part because if I'm going to do, you know, a drawing from it or uh, a painting or something like that, it gives me a little bit of an idea of what's going on. If I start coloring in all of the stuff that's more, uh, you know, the rust color, um, that's fine, but that will take me a lot longer. And if, if, you know, if Hazel is sort of standing there for a couple of minutes and moving around and I'm trying to get a, a whole drawing done, that's probably asking a little bit uh, much to be able to get that much detail in um, altogether. So I'm going to give you a few more minutes uh, working on this. Do double check your angles. Um, if you have any questions while we go along, um, just toss them in chat because I will have a look and, and, uh, and see if anybody has questions. Now, one thing that I really like to do, so I right here I just use sort of a pen and ink method so that you could see pretty easily what I was working on. But I actually really like to use softer pencils a lot when I'm um, drawing horses or animals. Um, it, it's just easier to get that feeling of form. Um, as you see, you know, when you're doing little lines like this for, for pen and ink, um, then you have to start making a lot of decisions. You know, what's What's the furry bit? What's the bit that I'm just showing, you know, darker rather than lighter? Um, you know, and likewise, when you do it in pencil, you can get a little bit more of a sense of form as well. But I'm sure as you're drawing on this, you're starting to see details uh, of Hazel, and particularly, um, you know, in the legs or perhaps how that stomach is actually formed. Um, and then there's always the problem of what to do kind of around the jaw. So, Hazel's got a, um, a, a jawline that disappears a little bit into sort of fur underneath, um, uh, kind of behind where you see the white. It sort of goes into fur. And I had a little trouble when I was sketching, trying to figure out exactly how to show that. Um, you know, if, if, I, if I was painting, it might be a little bit easier because I, I could just show color changes. So it takes a little bit of practice when you're drawing horses to kind of come up with some techniques that you would like to show the different parts to sort of show uh, different um, different planes, uh, you know, the shading, uh, the lighter areas. And so there's a, actually a book on drawing horses that I'm going to recommend um, at the end of our class. It's a, a book from, I think, the 1950s, and it's really good at giving direction on how to go about uh, drawing, drawing these, these fur directions, basically, is what we're, we're talking about. And then, of course, there's the business of getting the eye in the right place. So if you're having any trouble, um, which often happens, getting the eyes in the correct place, just double check the angle of, uh, for example, you can double check the angle of the, uh, the side of the ear to the eye, or you can double check, check the angle of the white of her muzzle uh, to, to the eye location. Um, you can also go from the back, from the top of her, her back, um, near her, her hindquarters and, uh, and use that angle to double check where the eye should land. So I use this business of double checking angles a lot because it helps me to get the proportions right on a horse. It also helps me, um, you know, check where the very specific uh, elements of, of an animal ought to be. And it also stops me from drawing too much um, the way that I did when I was a kid, <laughs> not just that first drawing, but you know my my kind of cartoony drawings that I spent lots of years doing. This uh, checking the angles helps me get back to worrying about the particular animal I'm looking at right now. 
So go ahead and wrap up your, your uh, sketch. I know that we are, we're doing this relatively quickly, um, but I want to give you a few minutes just to do something um, really quick with a bit more complex picture of Hazel at the very end. So I'm just going to move on right now. Oops. Okay, so one of the things that's important when you are deciding to draw a horse that has a lot of, um, you know, harnesses, bridle, reins, all of that stuff on, is to note how you can use the fact that all of this leather work goes around the body. Use those curves really accurately drawn to help you give a sense of form um, to the horse herself. So in this particular case, if you were to just draw Hazel, Hazel's head like this, it would be perhaps a little bit difficult to get that idea of how the top of her, her nose, how, the, how the, um, the whole feeling of those bones there between her eyes and her nose, how that works. And so this business of these angles um, and, and accurately drawing that little line at the top really helps. Sometimes I even sort of look at that and draw uh, with my pencil kind of in the air to get that, that feeling. And then it makes it easier for me to do it accurately on the paper. Likewise, you know, the, the business of the, of the harness going around her head, um, how, how the, uh, the bottom of her, her chin looks, uh, you know, that curve being really accurate, how the reins fall, because that gives an idea of, of three dimensions, and even how the curve of her mouth follows around. So I'm going to show you the same picture without all these little arrows on, because it makes it a bit easier. But you can really see, if you look at this, how accurately getting that business of, of the curve as it goes around her body, kind of in your imagination, if, if, she was, uh, if she was transparent, you'd actually be able to see the bridle go all the way around the other side of the horse, the, the um, harness go all the way around uh, in a nice oval. And to draw, drawing that stuff accurately really helps. So this is our last sketch. Uh, and this is definitely one, <laughs> this is definitely one that would take you longer than the time we have. But I wanted to just give you the chance to try to draw a more complex horse while we, were, while we uh, had this image up. And so when you do something like this, the very first thing is just to get some basic lines of the overall proportions. Don't worry about any of those harnesses, anything like that. You're just sort of trying to get the back. Uh, you know, a little bit of maybe of the side of her head, um, running down the chest and the front of the legs, the back of the legs and the underneath. You know, you're just going for the basics. The next thing to do, once you have that down, is lightly erase those, those lines and add a little bit more uh, description in there, a little bit more accuracy. And when you do that, you can start sort of blocking in where you see some of this harness stuff. Because as complex as it is, it actually will help you get some of the proportions right. Because there are some large angles that are created by the, uh, the harness around the neck, um, the, the lines, I think, uh, is what Michael called them, uh, that go back, what, what I think of as the reins, but he, I think he was calling them the lines. And, um, and the, also the way that the harness and all the leather work works at her rear end. That actually kind of gives you some stuff to measure off. What I wouldn't do is worry about buckles or anything like that. I would just put, you know, dark lines in where you see the stuff go. Um, likewise, you know, the blinders that she has, those are uh, useful um, like little, little roadmaps for uh, how, her, how the rest of her head would go. Now, if you're going to accurately draw something like this, it's going to take you a while. There is no way in you know, five minutes or so that you're going to be able to get anything more than sort of a general impression. But if you think right back to that initial sketch that we um, saw that Manet did uh, with the hackney cart and how with just a little bit of accuracy of, of general form, you can get the idea um, of the horse standing there, a little bit of, about what's going on. And then you've got that picture in your mind because you spent the time looking at the subject. And if you choose to go back and draw something more detailed later or, or do a painting or something um, like that, you've, st you've started getting this sort of storehouse of what horses look like in your head. Because we have to counteract those, those cartoon horses we see. We have to counteract um, you know, horses that people 
drew or painted that aren't all that accurate. And we also have to concentrate on this one horse and not sort of a generic horse to try to get, you know, the hazelness of hazel to come through. So let's just a few more minutes on this one before we wrap it up. One second, I'm just going to take a drink of my tea. And if you're finding it really difficult to get the proportions right, um, and you want to start drawing horses, one way to go about it is just to concentrate on the silhouette. So in other words, you would just sort of draw lines that indicate the, the outside of what you see and try to get, you know, if you, if you squint right now at, at the horse in general, and just try to get the overall sort of silhouette right. You can even color it all in black if you want to, so that it really does look like a silhouette. That can be a good way to start looking at the proportions and see if, seeing if you're getting them a little bit closer. All right, so we're going to move on at this point. I know this is even faster than our usual classes, isn't it? Okay, so recommended reading. At this point, you might be like, okay, I need more than you know, 20 minutes to, to be able to draw a horse properly. So if you have um, either anyone, either for yourself, or for somebody for Christmas, if you know somebody who might like to draw horses, I very highly recommend these two books in conjunction with each other. So one of them is a book that has been around for decades, and it's called Drawing Horses, a Learn to Draw Step by Step, and it's a Walter Foster book. Now, Walter Foster was an, was an artist and, and a marketing guy, graphic designer, this, that, and the other, who um, had a lot of illustrator friends uh, and painter friends. And he started putting out these books where different artists contributed on different subject matter. And um, if you're my age, um, you might have remembered uh, seeing these as we were growing up, particularly in craft stores and stuff like that. Some of them are better than others, but the one on drawing horses is really excellent. And it's relatively inexpensive. I've seen it for you know 10 to $15. Um, this is the new version, the, the one that's uh, got the purple on it. Um, that I think has just been published a few years ago, uh, but it's the same information. And what's wonderful about it is, as I said, this is really geared to somebody who is, is trying to draw a horse accurately, but without gimmicks. Um, and and the, the, how the pencil strokes can be used, you can even kind of see that from, the, from this front page here, to, to sort of indicate the sheen of a horse and the different planes. Um, and then this other book is, is a book, it's photographs, it's not a how to draw horses book, um, called the Horse Encyclopedia, which has really extraordinary photography in it. And what I particularly like about it is most of it is done with such a high quality lens that there's little distortion. So if you're interested in drawing horses and you really would like to be able to sketch them, uh, perhaps in the spring or summer when it's a lot warmer, um, if you have any around or uh, you know can possibly travel to uh, stables or, or, uh, or see any, um, if you spend this winter, you know, using some of the techniques from the Drawing Horses book uh, and, and using the, the really great photography in the horse encyclopedia, you'll have a really great sense of the anatomy and how to go about this so that when you do see a horse that you would like to draw a sketch really quickly, you've got the tools there to do it. All right, and you know how to get in touch with me uh, at any time if you have any questions or or uh, anything about art in general or about drawing horses. Uh, here's my website, uh, Instagram and Facebook, and, and also my email. And I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing now. <laughs> okay, everybody, I know that that was a whist another whistle stop tour, <laughs> a whistle stop tour of drawing horses. Um, but hopefully that kind of, you know, th this is something, this is a topic that I think a lot of us liked. We really loved drawing horses when we were younger. And for one reason or another, we sort of veered away from that. Um, why not have some fun, right? Why not maybe borrow some books from the Vineyard Haven Public Library or your local library on um, with pictures of horses and just give it a try. Get used to you know all of the things that, that come into drawing people or still life or landscape or whatever. All of that same stuff applies to horses, um, but they are super complex. I mean, I feel personally that they're more complex than drawing people. Um, there's, you know, it's just such an unfamiliar animal to most of us. So give it a try, because if you can do that, you can draw anything else. 